Okay, and uh, just so you know, I'm, uh, if it's all right with everybody, I'm just going to record this call. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I can turn my volume up on my microphone too, but uh, tell me if you can hear okay. Is that better? I'll keep talking while she turns it up. You want me to turn my mic up? A little bit. Okay, how's that? Any better? That's better, yes. Better. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, I guess you guys, first of all, thank you for being um, audiobook lovers. It's, um, I'm so proud to be part of the industry and I'm so glad you took the time to come out and say hello today. Hello, Marble Falls. Um, so I have been a voiceover talent ever since I got pregnant with my children because I am an actress by trade, but I wanted to keep working uh, while, you know, while pregnant and while raising children. So uh, voiceovers at that point meant more like commercials and announcing radio programs and training programs. And there were some audio books at that time, but if you, this is 30 years ago, there were very few. Now there are so many. And I had a career as a radio broadcaster. And when I left that radio station, I knew I had more time on my hands. And I thought getting started with audio books would be a great way to put a base onto my voiceover career and keep doing that. So that's what I did about 10 years ago. The process is to go and make a specific sample of you being an audiobook narrator called a demo. And even though I had been doing voiceover work for 20 years, I, I went for additional coaching because audiobooks is very specific. Raise your hands if any of you have ever listened to an audiobook and just hated the narration and just returned it. I see one hand in the back. Okay, a couple. So, yeah. Oh, every, oh, now everybody's admitting it. Okay. <laughs> the narrator is is very important, and I have two. So narrating an audiobook is a very specific skill. So I took some coaching. I made a demo and started sending it out to some of the major publishers and got started with my very first audiobook and uh, I think I have about a hundred and a hundred and five that I've completed so far some are in the works and uh, and I also spent a great deal of time doing children's audiobooks not um, many of which are not available on audible because they're more attached to um, like a cartoon or a, a children's video, something like that. So that's how I got started. And once you get one work, like any other business, you keep you keep uh, putting yourself out there. And now sometimes authors will contact me and ask me to to do the audiobooks. And as you can see back here, this is my booth. Um, this is where I go to get away from my children and grandchildren, but also to record my audiobooks. And it's it's called a whisper room. It's very soundproof. And uh, unless my unless an airplane goes by or my son is doing his laundry and the dryer's on, um, I can just go in there and shut out the noises of the world. So that's how I got started. What else would you like to know? What are, what are your burning questions? Yes, I am in I am in the fourth bedroom of my home upstairs, and my booth is a relatively new addition. I was kind of recording in a closet before, but uh, it's not a soundproof. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many people get started just pulling a comforter over their head and holding the microphone, but it, that doesn't last for long. It's quite uncomfortable, and audiobook narration is very specific in that you really want to keep the sound consistent from the beginning of the book to the end, and it's not just the sound of your voice, but it's the atmosphere in which you're recording, so having a booth is a perfect way to do that. I, I don't generally record any parts of the audiobook anywhere but in that room so that the listener's ear doesn't get jarred. So yeah, this is upstairs. Uh, you can say I have a window over there. So, and there is a window in the booth. If I could move my laptop, I would show you, but you you know, you can pretty much see what's in there. And um, yes, so it's in my home and that gives me the flexibility to, as long as I meet the deadline to record the audiobook every day and get it done. How long does it take to do a book? So that how the the question is how long does it take to do a book? It, it depends 
to an extent on the type of book. Let me talk you through the process and then I'll tell you. So when, when I do a lot of work for Tantor Media, I work for Gildan Media, I recorded books and sometimes some projects where I just work with the author. When I get this suggestion, I first go on Amazon and I look at the book and I see if I can look inside and see how it's written and see if it's something that I feel is a good fit for me. And by that, it doesn't have to be something that I'm necessarily interested in. It has to be something that I understand the potential listener's fascination by it. So for instance, I just finished reading a book on sexual selection and I just mean like in fruit flies, things like that. Um, it, was, it wasn't a very sexual book. It was about how people choose, how uh, animals choose their mates. Now this isn't, I'm fascinated by everything. So I, but I'd be more likely to read a magazine article about that, but to read an entire 12 hour book about it. I took that on because I thought it would be interesting, but also because I know there are some people to whom that is their passion. And I always picture the listener's need when I do that. Once I say yes to the book. If it's a fiction book, there's a certain amount of research that's involved, like pre-reading the entire book, because the tone you choose is, I'll tell you more about this later, but the tone you choose is going to be very different if it's a tragedy than if it's a comedy. So you have to want to get a sense of where the story is going and also start making a list of all the characters and what their accents might be, what they look like, so that when you create them, you keep them consistent and you have an idea. So I'm not even counting that time and the amount of time it takes to record it, but that's just preparation. It's pre-reading a book, maybe doing some research. If it's a nonfiction book, I don't necessarily read it all the way through first. I, I read the table of contents, so I have an idea of the, the big picture, but I have to re pre-read each chapter and make a list of the words I don't know how to pronounce, uh, authors whose names I've never heard of before. There's all, even the authors sometimes, they don't know how to, they don't have to know how to pronounce something to write about it, but I have to know how to pronounce it to bring it to life. So there's a certain amount of research that I don't get paid for unless it's an extensive amount, in which case I bill for it. But so once I've done that, I go into my booth and if if it takes me more than two hours to record one hour, then I'm not doing my job. So I would say to record it, if it's an easy book with not a lot of pronunciations, but if I've done my pre-work, it takes me about almost two to one, one and a half to two hours to get one finished hour of recording because you make mistakes, you have to do a line again, your your throat has to clear. I recorded a whole book recovering from a sinus infection and there was a lot of noises you did not want to hear on there. So I just had to let myself cough and keep going. So I may, some, some narrators stop and record over as they record, but I feel like that breaks my flow. So I record and if I make a mistake, I clap my hands and this way I, I can see it on the on the recording when I've made a mistake. And so I might end up with an hour and a half recorded, but it's only going to be an hour by the time I take all the mistakes out. And of course that depends on the book. So then there's the editing process. Now in editing, you have to listen through the whole thing and sometimes proofread it if you're the final, if you're the final editor, but Tantor does my proofreading but you have to listen back. And if something sounds weird, you go in and you re-record it. If you have, if your breaths are too loud, have you ever heard an audio book where the narrator keeps going, <gasps> you hear, keep hearing gasping or the breath is too loud? Some people are nodding their heads and people saying, no, good. Then you've heard well-edited audio books because we want a natural breath in there, but not anything distracting or too loud. So the editing process is at least two hours because think of it, you're listening to an hour, you're stopping, you're starting, you're reducing the breath, you're hearing it again. So the short answer to that big story I just gave you is between four, three and a half to six hours to create one finished hour of an audio book. Wow. 
Yeah, it's, you know, it's not as easy as it sounds because you want the product to be good. I always imagine someone's in their car or doing housework or taking a walk and it's very intimate. It's right in your ears or right in your car. And I don't want you, the listener, to be jarred by a weird noise or, or me breathing too loud or a word that sounds like I have a frog in my throat. So like anything, it's, it's in the details. So if I do it right, it, it does take time. So at the very least, four hours to create one finished hour. And I prefer to do the acting. So I actually hire an editor who I trust to... I send him the files. I clean them up a little bit so he's not listening to, you know, snorting and blowing my nose and coughing. I try to get those, you know, I don't want to gross him out. So, but I send him a file and, you know, he listens back and, and reduces the breaths and I pay him a certain amount of money so that that gets done for me. So I'm able to just do the recording. It takes longer than you think. Yeah. In the back. Or actually, Brittany, you call on them. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead, sir. Uh, do you prefer to produce abridged or full-length versions of books? That's a very good question. Do I prefer abridged or full-length versions? I prefer, in fiction, I always prefer full-length. I, I just feel like the abridged versions, and there aren't that many anymore. They, I think back in the day when you, ha you had to get cassette tapes or, I mean, going way back, like albums of, of audiobooks, but back in the day when you needed actual hard copies, like the CDs or the cassette tapes, then the, most producer, most co publishing companies would do full length and abridged because they could make the abridged one available and they just didn't feel like people had the patience. But nowadays they hardly ever do any abridged fiction that I'm aware of. If you're listening to an abridged version, it's generally uh, an older audiobook. Now that you can just download the whole thing. I, I haven't been asked to do an abridged version in 10 years. Now I will tell you in some of the nonfiction that I do, they're a little too wordy for me. I feel like some of them, and I'm not going to say which ones, were like someone's doctoral thesis and they just got it published and I'm doing the audio and I, <laughs> I feel like maybe they got paid by the word and there's just too many words. And sometimes I wish there was an abridged version of some of the nonfiction that I do, but uh, there is no choice there. I do the whole thing. And, you know, again, I have written a book and I actually voiced my own book, which was quite a fascinating experience. And I had to cut a hundred pages out of my book before the publisher would publish it. And it's hard. It's really hard to, to take those words that you slaved over and just put them aside and know it's never going to reach the listener. But I, I, I do generally prefer, I prefer absolutely the full versions of books. Yes, ma'am. Do you um, make a consideration about how fast you're going to read? Do you read some books faster versus slower? Because I know I've listened to, in the year era of cassette tapes, sometimes mm. I felt the reader was making too many pauses, and I felt like, oh, this five-hour book could have been read in three hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, how frustrating. Um, Even so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, again, I'm going to separate nonfiction from fiction. So for nonfiction, it really depends on the author style. I try to go on YouTube and just, I'm not trying to be the author, but I am. My friend George Guidal, I don't know if you've ever listened to any, George Guidal has, he's an amazing, he's amazing. He's done over a thousand audiobooks, And he does a presentation where he says, you know, the narrator is really the frame around the picture. The author's words are the picture. You're not supposed to be the picture. You're just supposed to frame it. So our job is to bring the author's words to light and channel the author as much as possible. I also try to channel the subject as much as possible. So for instance, right now I am reading, a, I'm in the middle of two projects. Both are self-help. I, I, I will never need any therapy again because I read so many self-help. 
<laughs> but one, one is I'm doing with the author and we're publishing it and it's called Soulmate, S-O-L-E-M-A-T-E. It was a bestseller about eight years ago and now we're producing the audiobook. And it's about becoming comfortable with yourself, knowing yourself so that you can then be really in a really healthy relationship. Now, when she's telling a story about her life, I kind of speed it up a bit because if I were telling you a story, I would, I would kind of tell it fast. And I only want to pause where I think your brain needs time to absorb it. If anyone has rushed through a story and you want to go, wait, 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 what? You know, then, so I want to pause just enough. And certainly the punctuation informs you. I want to pause just enough for you to get it, but I'm going to tell it at a storyteller pace. If I get to a part where I'm explaining something, as we do in real life, I, especially if it's a new concept, we're going to slow it down a bit and say, all right, so here's the first thing you have to do. So we have to pause in between things on a bullet list. But I, all, I, always, I know that people listen much, it's going to sound weird, people listen faster than we talk. We, I hope I have these numbers right. We talk at about 150 words a minute, and people can listen to about 700 words a minute. So if I'm talking too slowly, your brain is going to start making your grocery list in between. <laughs> so I try to keep the pace. And when I listen back, I try to put my listener ears on and, and say, is this too slow? Is this too fast? I did do a self-help book called Powerful Beyond Measure. And the author insisted that I slow down and pause more. And I wasn't really happy with that, but that was what she wanted. And I gave it to her. But sometimes it's just in that pause it should be between sentences. So I agree with you that the pace is really important and the pace will depend on the piece and where in the piece I am. And also when we read out loud, we tend to get almost rhythmic. Dick and Jane have a dog. We get into what I call the pledge of allegiance mode for non-experienced narrators <laughs> they go, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, and we don't get any meaning at all. So narrators and voiceover talents in general learn to look at a piece of copy and look for the words with meaning so that we will slow down and speed up naturally, as I'm doing right now, according to the meaning of what we're reading but we're not acting, we're not on stage. We are reading, but we're reading and interpreting at the same time. So it would be more like, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. So the pace is going to change as the meaning becomes clear. So I hope that answers your question. Good. Yes, ma'am. Um, my my husband he was on a job and he had to go back and forth to New Orleans and he listened to all the Harry Potter books. Oh my gosh, the uh, British uh, or American version? Huh? The British uh, or American was it? Jim Dale narrating? Yes, okay. it was something. I, didn't, I mean, but that man was incredible. And you're talking four hours for one hour. I'm thinking those and they were not a bridge. <laughs> no. Huge books. And I'm he, thinking, he is amazing. Go ahead. What's your question? And he did all those voices, and he, you knew who he was talking about. And I mean, I'm thinking four hours to one hour. How many thousands of hours did he put into that? Absolutely. So I have I have two responses to that, and one is that not every book is done in your home studio. <laughs> uh, so well, he'd be locked in there for days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They'd have to feed him through a hole in the wall. Um, <laughs> So Jim and, and George Guidal, there are other narrators that don't do their own editing. There are many studios where you go in and it's something like the Harry Potter book and some of the books that I've done, you're in the booth and someone else is recording you. You have an engineer and you may also have a director. So it's actually a group effort. So for that book, he was in a recording studio, I believe in New York, but wherever it was, and he just read and he had an engineer to worry about the to worry about the editing later and also to say, ah, oh, you know, let's do that and, and a director to say, let's do that paragraph again, 
or, you know, you're trying to be Dumbledore, but he sounds a little bit like, I, you know, I can't think, I can't think of anybody else right now, but you know, so you have another couple of set of ears in, in that type of recording. So it may have taken him two hours to record one hour, but then he was done. Then someone else does the editing and someone else is, and also someone else is listening as he does it to say, let's slow that pace down a little bit or, but also he's just brilliant. And what, yeah, he's amazing. So he didn't, you know, he didn't have to spend four hours to one. He probably spent two to one and then the other people did the other work. But, and he had another set of years proofing and listening as he went. So that process is more expensive for the publisher, which is why so many of us record from home now. But it's also more collaborative, which we love. The other thing I wanted to mention is that when you have a book like that, first of all, it helps to be an actor. And uh, if if you like, you can ask a question later about how we develop characters. But if we have a lot of characters in a book, we need to keep track of them. We need to keep track. Uh, that's why we pre-read it. And you don't want to get to chapter 12 and find out that Joe has a Texas accent. When you didn't know that, and then you've gone through the whole book and now you have to go back and do all of Joe's dialogue again. So that's why in fiction, it's so important to pre-read the book. Even if they say, you know, Joe was a, a big lumbering man with a heavy beard at 350 pounds and six foot five. Well, he's going to sound different. You have to, you know, you get that visual in your head and it's not just what he looks like, but it's personality. Is he gruff? They may mention the type of voice that he has. So um, J.K. Rowling did amazing character development. Like you can, even before the movies, you could picture every single one of those characters. So I'm sure as any actor, he did his research. He knew who the characters were. And then there's always a little room for just, I can't plan how this one's going to sound. I just have to see how they come out of my mouth. And you stand differently. So you can feel each character in your body. If you're doing a young character, your eyes may get really wide. If you're doing an old character, you might stoop over, you, you'll place it differently. So you kind of memorize in your body where that character lives, but it also helps to have a reference, either a visual, like the notes you took, or a lot of narrators make an audio reference. I did a series of romance novels, which all took place on Mustang Ranch, and there was one every well well we can talk about romance novels but every you know every, it was a it was a dude ranch so every story was some guest that came and what her problem was and the cowboy she met and you know all that so there was different cowboys and different young ladies and different young men but there was an Auntie M type character that was throughout the, Granny, I think was her name. And so I had to keep her consistent throughout all eight books. So I saved a file of her voice so that if I couldn't find her in my body, I would listen again and go, oh, there she is. Oh, you know, so you might have, you, you have a reference if you get lost, especially if characters are very, very similar. You have to, and, and it's not a cartoon. Like to me, you want to create now. Jim Dale is different, and Harry Potter is very much character voices, almost like animated. But a lot of novels, it's just a flavor of the person. I'm not going to do this to sound like a man. It's just fake. So a woman making making a male voice is just a little more matter of fact or just a little more hesitant or, you know, you find that character within your voice just to suggest him or her so that if the two people are having a conversation, the listener knows without having to say he said, she said, because we're not allowed to add words. But yeah, Jim Dale is... George Guidal, I, you know, I, I can name so many people. Anyone who's ever won won an earphones award or an audio, you know, an audio award, they're masters. And in fiction, they're masters at characters. I'm so glad you enjoyed those books. They're great. So when you read uh, to record, are you sitting or standing? It depends. I have. I, I generally stand for things that require a great deal of energy or if 
it's the beginning of a chapter and my, my map, my body's just not awake yet. I will move the microphone up and stand for a while until, till I wake up. And, but then I sit, but I don't sit on a chair in some studios you do, and you just have to, you, you have to use your singing and breathing techniques and sit up straight and make sure your diaphragm is full. I sit on a drafting stool, which is actually higher than a bar stool. So that, it, I, it's almost like I'm standing, but I had to do that when I, I had a little accident and, and one leg was paralyzed for about nine months. So I, I had, to, I did try standing and then I got tired. So I sat down. So sitting or standing, I think for long books, you mostly sit so you don't run out of energy. But if a book requires a lot of energy, like for a kid's book, I would stand up. So it depends. When I voice this is more voiceover, but I just voiced an awards show and I would never sit down for that because you have to be what they call the voice of God or the voice of goddess in this case. So <laughs> it's that like, ladies and gentlemen. So you have to stand for that. It's difficult to do sitting down. Most narrators do sit for comfort and we're very grateful for iPads because we, I can show you actually, because I have mine right here. We actually upload, the, we, I, we used to have to worry about turning pages or they'd give us the galleys. You guys know what galleys are? No. Just, you know, before the book comes out, they send you like Xeroxed pages. So this is my, um, this is an app on my iPhone and it's called, on my iPhone, it's called I Annotate. You don't have to read, but so I, uh, I don't know what happened there. Oh, Siri popped in. So I don't have to worry about pages. I just scroll up or I scroll down. I can also highlight a word and look it up. It's it's really amazing. Some people even have a foot pedal that turns the pages for them in the iPad. So we don't have to worry about it. What else would you like to know? Yes, sir. Um, a fledgling audio narrator, does he or she require an agent to contact them? If a fledgling audiobook narrator were here, would she require an agent? Is that the question? Yeah, uh, an agent and um, yeah, it's an agent. Okay, good question. So this is generally about how would one get started in audiobooks? Right. Is that really right? Um, okay, so I'll answer the agent question first. Are you guys still hearing all right? I'm hearing a little echo back. Is it okay? I think our air conditioner just turned on, so maybe oh, that's why. Oh, okay. All right. But you can hear me okay, right? Yes. 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 Okay. So a big, big powered Jim Dale has an agent and George Guidal has an agent. They also do other types of acting work. And so getting an audio book would be part of, because remember the agent makes 10% or more depending, but 10% is the union. So they might use an agent for some of the big audio books like Random House and Hachette Books. They have their own studios. They hire their own and they often hire big names. I'm sure Meryl Streep voiced the Velveteen Rabbit and her agent got 10% of it. That's just the business for the big stars. Well, let's go back to someone like me. Audiobook narration is not the most lucrative field of voiceover. It's actually very low pay e compared to getting a national commercial or getting e-learning. I can make, if I were to produce, and I'm just telling you this so that you'll understand the agent thing. If I were to produce one hour of e-learning, like a training for fetal heart monitors or something, I mean, that's part of what I do too. I would make probably at least five times as much for that finished hour than I make for a finished hour of audiobook. Many audiobook narrators accept the relatively low pay for the feeling of serving our listeners and for the delight we have in reading. I love reading. I love I'm fascinated by everything. So I have learned so much as a narrator from everything from how to potty train your baby, which my daughter found very helpful, to uh, to sexual selection among fruit flies. Like, it, you know, they're not all the Audi winning titles, but you learn a lot. And so for the pleasure of reading out loud and the the feeling that 
your work will remain forever for somebody to enjoy 10 years down the line. Unfortunately, the pay scale doesn't yet reflect that. On the plus side, if you're getting an audiobook and you it's a 12-hour audiobook, that's 40 hours of work. It's a full week's work worth of work. Whereas in voiceover, we may spend five hours looking for business and two hours delivering business. We say being behind the microphone is the payoff. Looking for the work is the is the hard job, or auditioning is the hard job. So um so for that reason, many agents don't want to represent you just for audiobooks because they're going to make 10% of not very much. So you wouldn't need an agent to begin. What you would need to do is, first of all, get good at it. And you can do that through volunteer work, looking for, you know, uh, reading for the blind. A lot of people come to me when I was coaching. Oh, I read out loud to my kids all the time. Can I make a million dollars audiobook narrating? <laughs> Well, it's a little bit more than that, but so you can you can get started by getting coached by going on YouTube, and somebody could listen to this if if I can put it on YouTube. You you learn about the business, you get good at it, and you generally have to get the work yourself. Getting an agent is usually a bonus after you're already making money. I do have several agents, but I've never gotten an audiobook through an agent. I've gotten an audiobook by any other small business sending out you know reaching out to publishers and having them say yes or word of mouth there is also a website and i'm very grateful to tantor media they keep me they just keep sending me books so i love them for that you know would you like to be submitted for this sure and so i don't have to do that much marketing as an audiobook narrator and i do have time to do my other audiobook work then there, then there is a way, there are sites where you can produce it yourself and you don't have a publisher reach out for you. You're familiar with audible.com. Do you guys download your audiobooks onto your devices? So audible produces a lot of audiobooks for download purposes and not all of them are available in your local library on the shelves. That's, you know, the hard copy, the CD is, well, let me just see how many of you generally get like a CD copy or something of the, or a play away or something. Okay. How many of you just listen like on your iPhone or your iPod through downloads? Okay, good. So there, so anything that's on CD, pardon me, is also available as a download, but there are many, many books that are not available on your shelves and you can only get them as a download. And so, Audible Creation Exchange called ACX is where, like, if you wrote a book and you wanted me to voice it, you or you wanted to find another narrator to voice it, you could post it on this website and you could pick from any of the narrators and ask them to audition for you and you can do it. So I forgot where I started telling you about ACX. Um why did maybe it has to do with the agents? I don't remember. So, uh, so in that case, you're producing your own audiobooks, and either the author will pay the narrator directly, or you agree that you'll share the royalties when it sells. So the the industry keeps changing, and I totally forgot the question. So if there was a question I didn't answer, please ask it again. <laughs> Is that it? It's still on the agent question, I guess. Okay. So some some books you way you contract them out, there will be royalties versus a one-time payment exchange? Yes. You know, most publishers only pay you per finished hour. And obviously, Meryl Streep is going to make more per finished hour than I am. But there is a minimum set by the union, and that's about $200 a finished hour. It's not a lot when you think about how many hours goes into it. I mean, it works out to about 50 bucks an hour for my work or 40 bucks, depending on the research and so on. But obviously, you can ask for more than the minimum. But that is approximately the Screen Actors Guild AFTRA minimum for audiobooks. If you have an agent, they could negotiate a higher fee. And some people do make higher fees, and I have made higher fees. But generally, if you've produced that audiobook, you don't get royalties. You just get paid for your work and you're done. Now they are start there is starting to be some movement towards seeing if publishers will pay additionally for the narrators 
especially if the narrators are involved in the publicity. Like I've just begun to be invited to the launch parties for the books because I'm the narrator. And rather than have the author up there reading from her book, they invite me up to read from the book. So now if I'm helping with publicity, there should be a fee for that, or there should be a share of the royalty. So the union is working on it. I'm sure that, and again, if you have an agent, they could negotiate for that. But most of us do it and just like a baby, you just send it out into the world and hope that it does some good for somebody. But once it's out there, it sells a million copies or two copies, I don't, there's no difference to me except in feeling better about it. But on ACX, if I do it for royalty share, every time a, a copy is sold, I will get a small royalty. So they're working on giving a little more credit to the narrator by including royalties, but generally no, generally you get paid for your work and, and you're done. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I would like to ask you about the coaching you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, where would you suggest one start to look for a coach? Okay, very good. I very good question. So you can get coaching locally in person, or you can get it online on Skype. There are very many. I'm trying to think in Texas. Um, I don't know where Marble Falls is. So what major city are you near? Austin is our major city. You're near Austin. Austin is a huge city for voiceover. A lot of it is video games, but there might be voiceover studios where you could go in person and take a class about audiobook. I mean, I could do it for you right now, but you would Google audiobook narration coaching. Oh, okay. And but also you can begin for free on YouTube and do a search where it says, uh, you know, uh, you can look for videos on how to narrate an audiobook. And sometimes people put free stuff on there and you can get a sense of it. There's a, I'll just name some names that I know coach and you can check them out as well. One name is Carol Monda, C-A-R-O-L. And her last name is M O N D A. She does audiobook coaching. And Mark Cashman, C A S H M A N, does audiobook coaching. I can't think of any more off the top of my head, but maybe I can send it to Iona when it's done. But if you Google, check out whatever free videos they have on YouTube. See if you like them, see if you like their style. And there may also be voiceover schools, but audiobook is very specific. So just be wary of voiceover coaches who are going to tell you you're fantastic before you are. <laughs> you know, you're. I took my coaching from a guy named Grover Gardner. He was he was great, uh, and it was a class I took. And the classes are a good way to begin. Grover Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E He's in Oregon with Blackstone Publishing. And at the end of the class, they will often try to sell you a coaching package. In my case, because I had so much voiceover experience, he said, you know, honestly, let's just go straight to the demo, but I'll coach you through your demo. And he did. So he served as my director when I did my demo. Other people, he he could make money by saying, well, let's do your demo. You're fantastic. But he wouldn't let that happen. When I used to coach voiceover, I would tell people, don't make your demo before you're good. Because if you can't deliver what that demo promises, then you have lost yourself a client. So you want to get the coaching to avoid those, you know, being too slow, being too fast and so forth. So I would, I would start by Googling it. And if you want to go in person, you know, check Austin because there are a lot of voiceover talents in there, but talent doesn't necessarily mean they can coach. So you're better off with someone who's really skilled at audiobook coaching and they'll do it by Skype. And that's a good way to do it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What kind of investment do you have in your little booth? So this booth is general, it's called a whisper room and it's generally about $5,000. It is not 100% soundproof. It is 80% soundproof for me, but that's fine. Uh, you know, uh, it, 
I wait. If the airplane goes by, I just wait. And I tell my kids not to do the laundry now. <laughs> so, I'm all, but I don't have to yell down the stairs as much as I used to. So, but there are a lot of ways to begin depending on where you live. So what many people do and what I did for years before I got this booth was, if I can turn, I don't think you can really see it, but all right. So there is, so there is, let me see if I can, I'm going to walk over. So this is, can you see that happen? Yes. yes. Okay. So I got these moving blankets and I used these for a long time from vocalboothtogo.com and they're on a ceiling track and I went inside here to record for the longest time. It wasn't soundproof and there's a closet in here. And this is where I did a lot of my recording for years, but it just came out of the closet. <laughs> what is that? You came out of the closet. <laughs> I came out of the closet. I absolutely did. So finally, it, it you know, and it was it was difficult in there because it wasn't soundproof, and it. But you do also want the sound to be absorbed, and sound absorption is different from soundproofing. So this is why if you live in a quiet neighborhood and there's no kids screaming and no dogs barking, then you can. You can, you can record in a walk-in closet filled with your clothing because that absorbs sound very, very well. So if you're interested in getting into the field, it, it's a good idea to start small and build your way up. You want consistent sound. You want a decent microphone. You need a recording system. I don't know if I can share my screen. Let me just see if I'm allowed. That's recent chats. I don't want to mess with anything. So I was going to show you a bit of what it looks like to record, but I don't open conversation. No, I don't think I can share a screen. Let me see more options. Um, nope. All right. I'm not going to share my screen, but I have, uh, it's called a DAW, a digital audio workstation, and you need something on your computer to record you. Similar to GarageBand if you have an Apple, but on Windows, you can, if you want to play with it, how many of you are interested in becoming narrators? Because I'm getting a lot of questions like that. Okay. So you can play with it by downloading something called uh, Audacity. Now, don't go to audacity.com if you're checking this out on your smartphone right now. Audacity.com might be a porn site. I'm not sure, but it's not what you want. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, but it's not. You just, just click Audacity Digital Workstation or something, and, and it will get you to whatever that website is. And that is a free download. And you can go on YouTube and, and just how to use Audacity. And if you've never recorded your, I mean, we're also device savvy right now. You know how to push record, you know how to push play, but it's the editing where you get into trouble. But, you know, I would, if you're interested, get, you know, have you download this thing onto your computer. You must have an external microphone. You're not going to lean into your laptop and talk, you know, talk into the microphone. You have to have good sound. If it's echoey or if the microphone is subpar, it's going to be jarring to the listener. So you can get a decent beginner microphone that you plug into your computer for under $100. Uh, there is, a, if you want to know more about that, there is... Uh, edgestudio.com, E-D-G-E studio.com. And if you go there, they have a section where, with all kinds of resources. They are a great place to go for coaching. If you want to do audiobook coaching, you can book with Carol Monda through there. Check them out and join their mailing list because they will send you information about classes and there may be an audiobook class coming up that you can attend virtually. And that's a good place to begin and not a huge investment. They also have something called a mic finder, which shows you the different microphones and how much they are and what you would use them for. So you would need a computer with, with a workstation on it. And so far, you've spent nothing if you already own a computer. I'm assuming you do. And the microphone, which could be 100 I mean, eventually, you'll want a more expensive one, but I'm talking starter studio. And you get the whole setup and put it in your walk-in closet and get yourself comfortable and start trying. 
and just see how it feels. You may find you hate the work. You may find you love the work, but you don't know if you don't try. I, I, I've written about other things as well, and I'm a speaker and an author, and I, I do speak about one of my workshops is called Toss and Dare. What do you toss out of your life? And with the space you get, what do you dare to do? So daring to do something, the first step can be the hardest because to take a first step means you're taking a dream and you're turning it into a goal. And dreams are fantasy land. Dreams are always there to escape to. And I have a dream of being on Broadway. I may, ne I may never make it because I don't really want to leave my grandchildren for eight performances a week. <laughs> so that is, you know, maybe someday, but right now it's not a goal. A go if it were a goal, my first step would be to get into New York more often and get myself a theatrical agent. So your first step, if you're thinking of being an audiobook narrator, would be to read as much about it as you can. And another excellent resource is voiceoverextra.com, voiceover, and then there's no E. It's just voiceover, the letter X, T-R-A.com. And you sign up for free for their newsletter, and they have tons of articles. And then you can search on audiobook narration. Uh, one more go to audio the the audiobook publishers association APA audiobook publishers association if you google that it'll send you to the right site and there is a whole page on there called so you want to be a narrator and they spell it all out for you so i hope i've given you enough resources to get started if you want but it can begin with your computer a free digital workstation your own walk-in closet if you have one and a microphone and something to read. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think we'll take um, a couple more questions. So, okay. yes, sir. Do you listen to books and who's your favorite reader? Ah, yes, I do. I am an avid audiobook listener. I love George Guidal. I love oh, um, Jeff. Ah, oh, Wasserman. What's his last name? Oh, I can't remember. It. Wood, Wood, I think it's Woodman. He did uh, The Art of Racing in the Rain. Uh, I think it's Jeff Woodman. Uh, there are Exe Sands. I mean, there's so many whose work I love. And sometimes the author will read their own book. And I generally don't love that. No. <laughs> Have you... They've not been coached, but occasionally, if I give it a half an hour, I get used to it, and I don't, I don't hate it as much, and I, and I appreciate that they, that they did the narration. But sometimes I, I just have to return it and read, read the print version. So Cassandra, oh, I can't remember. You know, any of the, if you if you look on audio. Uh, audio file awards, audio, um, you know, the audio awards or the earphone awards, those people are all amazing. So I will sometimes just look for the narrator and get other books by that narrator. But we all, no matter how good we are, accept books that we don't love. So the work is not always as great. Uh, Donna Postal, a friend of mine, is really good. So if I like someone's work, I will look for more people like that. But off the top of my head, that's all I can think of. I'm sure I'll kick myself after I hang up for all the people I should have mentioned. But All right. One more. Yes, ma'am. Um, got it. Like that. Do you have author? I mean, do you do like series? You said you did romance. Mm -hmm. like, there's so many books. Are, is the audio business increasing? Because a lot of us, well, all of us in here, I'm assuming, listen to audio books. Mm -hmm. So is that an increasing volume? Exploding. Okay. The audio book. I mean, that is why if you want to get into narration, I don't know how much money you'll make because you'll probably start on ACX and maybe not make, make that much. But, you know, you work your way into it. When you think about, and again, that side of the uh, Audiobook Publishers Association has a page on the history of audiobooks. You can get more information there. But when it started, even 10 years ago when I started, bestsellers, history books and classics were pretty much what got read. 
And the best sellers had the abridged and unabridged version. Now, Tantor will send me stuff that was published eight years ago and they just didn't have an audio book. And now because they don't have to produce the CDs or the cassettes, it's a lot cheaper for them to make it available as just a download. So now there are magazine articles that they will put out as kind of an audio ebook, if you will. There are, I recently published one on my own. I found an old magazine article called Don't Be a Doormat from 19, 1929. And I know. Well, I had this magazine. Is it? Is it here? I don't know. Anyway. It, oh, here it is. Look. So among my parents' things when they passed away was this old, look at the font. So it was this old magazine called the American Magazine. I mean, if, it's fascinating to look through. And I found these articles that could just as well have been written today. People were struggling with the same self-help issues as we are. So this, oh, here it is. This is called Don't Be a Doormat. <laughs> and you can, and it's about not spoiling your children and not giving Susie candy just because she's crying. And I'm like, this is public domain. I'm just going to record it and put it for sale on Audible. And then I wrote a foreword and I wrote sort of a reaction to it because he didn't go into assertiveness skills. And I was able to just publish it through Spoken Realms. And it's a short audio book with his article. So it's written by Randy Kay and Dr. Frank Crane. <laughs> so I, it, I just did it for fun. And then I got a graphic artist to create the cover and it's available for download. So it's just interesting how many things you can now, I also did Peter Pan uh, and that only to, I was asked to read Peter Pan. They needed a female narrator. I auditioned, I got the job and I've always wanted to play Peter Pan on Broadway and that ship has sailed and I'm too tall. <laughs> <laughs> But by reading the audiobook, I got to be Peter Pan, and the dialogue is almost exactly the same as the Broadway show. So I got close. I got to be Captain Hook, and you get to be all the characters. So they published it, and then I go on Amazon, and there's like 10 people who voiced Peter Pan. One of them might be Jim Dale. Who knows? So you're going to buy him. You're not going to buy me. But, it, you know, it's still, it's, it's so much fun. And you know what? When my, when my granddaughter's old enough, granddaughters, I should say, I, maybe they'll listen to it in the car. You know, you do a commercial, it disappears in six months. You do an audio book, it's around forever. And that's a really nice thing for me to keep in mind when I'm in that booth. And I, believe me, I'll be sweating there in the summer. I'll probably be in my underwear recording because it's hot in there. But I, it, when I think of the listener who hopefully will be entertained or educated by the work I'm doing in conjunction with the author, it does my heart good. And at, you know, at the heart of everything you do is bringing more love into the world and paying your mortgage too. But <laughs> I, I, yeah, that, that matters. But I, when I think of this work as bringing more love into the world and doing my little part to make someone's day easier, it, it makes me feel so good about what I do. And I'm just so delighted you guys showed up in the morning to talk to me. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Randy. My pleasure. All right. And so um, would you actually mind sending Iona a copy of this recording? Because I'm thinking no. maybe we could post that on our YouTube channel as well. Absolutely. And if she, if she can feel free to caption it with ways to get in touch with me or with any of the resources that I mentioned, she can mm -hmm. feel free to put them in as a caption. That would be fine. You can, you can, many of you probably Googled me already, but if you need to find out more information about me or my titles on Amazon or Audible, it's Randy with a Y E and K with a Y E. And you can go over to randyk.com and you can see some of the things I do and, and information about the book I wrote called Ben behind his voices, which I also voiced. And that was a, an award nominee. So that's, that's my one award claim to fame. And if you know anybody that has mental illness in their, family. This is a memoir I wrote about my son's schizophrenia and how our family coped and is coping with it and how we got from chaos to hope with schizophrenia. So I'm very proud of that book and proud to have voiced it as well. So you can find information about all of that and any of the other resources. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.